Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's virtual media briefing about COVID-19 in London and Middlesex County. We're very happy to have you along with us today and happy to be joined, as you've heard, by the Mayor of London, Ed Holder, the Medical Officer of Health at the Middlesex London Health Unit, Dr. Chris Mackey, and the Medical Director at London Health Sciences Centre, Dr. Adam Ducolo. Uh, we also welcome the media who are in attendance this afternoon. We've already got a, a lot of questions in the queue. And just a reminder that if you have not yet uh, submitted a question and you'd like to, use the question form here on Microsoft Teams. Just hover over the center of your screen. You'll see the text bubble appear with a question mark in it. Click on that and you can submit <coughs> your questions. Please do indicate your name, your media outlet, and who your question is for. And we also welcome this afternoon those who are tuning in on Global News Radio, AM 980 CFPL, those listening um, on Rogers Television, as well as the Rogers Facebook page and YouTube channel, and those who are joining us through the CTV London website. Let's get to the opening remarks, and we'll start this afternoon with Mayor Ed Holder. Well, thank you, Dan, and good afternoon, everyone. Let me start as I do on Mondays with a quick rundown of this weekend's bylaw enforcement activities. Only two charges were laid. One was a retail jewelry store open to the public, when obviously it should not have been. The other was a games store closed to the public. However, employees inside were not masked and were not phys physically distancing. Both of those establishments received $880 tickets. But aside from that, it was a quiet weekend for bylaw enforcement officers and really truly speaks to the cooperation and support that we've had from uh, our business community and Londoners in general. You know, I remain cautiously optimistic when it comes to our COVID case counts. We continue to see a noticeable downward trend here at home and across the province. I did some uh, number crunching earlier today and our current seven day average has dropped to 55 cases per day. The prior seven day average was 81. So really, that's a significant decline and I'm hopeful that trend will continue. Tomorrow marks one month since our second province-wide lockdown started. The longer it goes, I know the harder it is on everyone, especially students and their parents who continue to have to juggle remote learning with working from home. You'll remember students in our region have been out of class since Christmas break on December 18th. That should be a huge source of motivation and inspiration as we work to get these case counts even lower. We want our kids back in school. We want people back at work. But more than anything, we want everyone safe and healthy. We've proven before that we can do it. Like I said, I'm becoming more hopeful by the day that we can do it again, especially when we see the success we've been having over the last few weeks. So Londoners, let's keep it up. Let's continue working together to drive those numbers even lower. Thanks so much and over to you, Dr. Mackey. Thanks very much, Mr. Mayor. So as you say, numbers are tremendously positive today. Just 27 cases locally, two deaths. We haven't seen a case count that low in over a month here. Uh, provincially, similar trend, uh, dipping under 2,000 for the first time in almost a month. Uh, these are good news. There are, of course, some cautions. Uh, the death we saw over the weekend of a young man is very sad uh, for everyone involved. I can assure you, uh, no easier for those in public health who had to uh, support that family and in a difficult situation. Uh, the other positive is around the vaccine news. We did complete vaccinations in all long-term care homes uh, for residents who are eligible uh, as of yesterday. So that is completely done in this region. We'll be going back in about uh, two or three weeks for second doses for all of those homes. Uh, the, uh, the other positive on the vaccine front, we will be able to start offering second doses soon. Uh, we're still working on whether supplies uh, will allow us to deliver those vaccines to uh, homes and to staff uh, within uh, the 28 day period or where the things will have to be pushed out to 42. Uh, it looks like it will be a combination based on risk. Uh, I'll also share that we are into high, high risk retirement homes this week. Uh, we're in there today with the four deployment vaccination teams and we will complete all of those by Wednesday of this week. So after that, we'll take about a week and a half pause as we uh, acquire additional vaccine supplies for second doses. Uh, we had a, a bit of uh, unfortunate news. The uh, UK variant, uh, unfortunately, we've documented spread in this community. This is dated information. It is based on the information 
Uh, the same case of the initial case of UK variant that we had from back in December, one of the close contacts of that individual also became positive for COVID. We did ask that that sample be tested and uh, that sample was positive as well. So again, this is a case from back in December. Uh, unfortunately, that person died in December. That person was reported at the time as one of the deaths in our uh, daily death counts. Uh, but so we have a case of transmission of UK variant in this community and uh, unfortunately a related death. We've also asked the uh, Public Health Ontario lab that does the testing for the genetic fingerprinting to look at samples from several of the community-based outbreaks uh, that have spread quickly, including Middlesex Terrace, Country Terrace, as well as uh, EMDC and uh, a local homeless shelter where we've seen spread of cases. And we hope to have all of those results back some point this week. And uh, no other cases of UK variant have yet been detected in Middlesex and London. Dan, I'll pause there. I'm sure there'll be questions. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Mackey and Mayor Holder. Uh, and thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to join today's briefing and provide an update uh, on the COVID-19 situation at, uh, at London Health Sciences Centre. I'm pleased to report that we have resolved both outbreaks at Victoria Hospital over the weekend. This leaves only the adult emergency department at University Hospital and outbreak at LHSC. There are nine staff members associated with this outbreak, zero patients and zero deaths. The UHED remains open and is safe for patients who need emergency care as the risk of infection for patients remains very low. It is important that people do not delay seeking emergency care at UH when it is needed. UH remains a safe place to receive care during this time. Thank you to our staff and physicians and our infection prevention control team who respond to COVID-19 outbreaks with speed and diligence to ensure they stop further spread and protect each other and our patients. We currently have a total of 15 patients, inpatients that are COVID-19 positive, six of whom are in critical care. As community case numbers continue to decrease and our inpatient and critical care numbers continue to de decrease, we are planning a further increasing increase of operating room capacity as of Wednesday, January 27th. We will be increasing our surgical capacity to 85 to 90% of normal volumes at University Hospital. This means 13 and a half of 15 operating rooms will be running at UH. At Victoria Hospital, we have been running at approximately 90% for 17 of 19 operating rooms since last Wednesday and will continue to do so. Our focus remains on managing the pandemic by preventing containing outbreaks, maintaining as high as possible scheduled activity volumes and ensuring we are engaged with our regional partners to ensure there's enough hospital capacity for those who require it. Despite our surgical increases, we remain ready to support our region and province, and we are monitoring our capacity daily. Dan? Thank you very much, Dr. Duglow. Thank you, Dr. Mackey, and thank you, Mayor Holder. All right, we do have, uh, uh, I think, the biggest total of questions we've had in the queue so far. So we've got a We've got a bunch to get through, so let's get to them right away. And we do recognize that a lot of these questions have to do with the um, the death of a teenage male that was reported on the weekend. So uh, let's go with the first. Dr. Mackey, this one is for you. It comes to us from Merrick Sutherland at CTV News. Since it is confirmed the family of the in teenager who has tested positive uh, with COVID, uh, since it is confirmed the family of this teen has tested positive with COVID, what is the latest on the follow-up investigation? Yeah, I appreciate the question, Merrick. Uh, unfortunately, I think we're all going to have to be satisfied with the limited information that we currently have. Uh, there won't be an autopsy done on this individual. Uh, I know there are questions of whether this is somebody who died of COVID or died with COVID. Uh, unfortunately, we won't get answers to that. Uh, and uh, I wish uh, we could provide more details, but they won't be unfortunately available. All right, thank you, Dr. Mackey. So that would also address Merrick's second question, which is it possible the young man died with COVID, not from COVID? Again, not something that uh, we're going to be able to provide. Uh, another question from Merrick, uh, Dr. Mackey, what are the provincial guidelines when it comes to reporting COVID related deaths? Yeah, so the, there are provincial guidelines. Uh, if you've got a situation where COVID could have uh, contributed to the death, uh, it's considered to be a COVID-related death and it's reported in our death counts. Uh, if there's a situation where the individual clearly died of a cause unrelated to COVID, 
then it can be excluded. And we've had to uh, do that in the past where there was a diagnosis of COVID and then it was later confirmed that the individual uh, died of other causes. Uh, but that's got to be fairly clear cut. You can imagine that COVID can contribute to exacerbation of a number of diseases. And if that's the case, then it is something that is counted as a COVID death. Thank you, Dr. Mackey. Uh, and we do have a couple of other questions from Merrick. Merrick, uh, because of the number of questions, I am going to come back to those, but we're going to move ahead uh, to some other questions. Uh, a question from Jennifer Beeman. And again, Dr. Mackey, this is about uh, the death that was reported on Saturday. Dr. Mackey, the health unit is not the coroner and vice versa. What information does the health unit know about the death of this team and what details does it not know? Yeah, I mean, uh, we know the individual's identity, who they are in close contact with. Uh, we know that it's somebody who had symptoms and then days later presented to emergency room. Uh, beyond that, we don't have a lot of information. Again, the uh, we have been in touch with the coroner. Dr. Summers and I both each spoke with the coroner on Sunday, but uh, we won't be getting additional information and an autopsy will not be performed. Thank you. And Dr. Mackey, Jennifer does have a follow-up question. I, I know we've sort of talked uh, about this already, um, but still want to ask the question because it's a subtle difference, I think. Uh, Dr. Mackey, based on the information the health unit has about the death of the teen reported Saturday, is it inaccurate to say he died of COVID-19? I, I appreciate the question. We won't be able to confirm. Uh, not that we have the information, we can't share it. It's that there won't be a medical investigation to be able to confirm this. Uh, this is in part because, you know, the family's chosen uh, to uh, proceed with the burial and there won't be an autopsy for that reason. Thank you very much. Let's move on to some questions from Andrew Graham at Global News Radio AM 980 CFPL. Uh, Dr. Mackey, this one is for you. The region reported 27 cases today and the case numbers have been declining over the last week. Can this be credited to the lockdown and stay at home order? Yeah, there's there's no doubt that the, uh, I guess uh, uh, the first version was called the shutdown that, that went into place December 26th. The shutdown is definitely having an effect here. And the lockdown that we're actually uh, almost two weeks from now, uh, will start to play out in the numbers now as well. So that will be definitely part of what you're starting to see here. We would really look out to the rest of this week to see uh, how much difference a, the uh, hard lockdown made compared with the shutdown that happened December 26th. And Andrew has a follow-up. Dr. Mackey, do you think this level of distancing that is included under the stay-at-home order will be sufficient to control the new variants uh, that we know are circulating and that you mentioned again during your opening remarks? Yeah, it's a really very much important open question. Uh, what will happen if we relax restrictions seeing that things are moving in the right direction, will that be just in time for the UK variant or other variants to hit very hard and to increase cases? Uh, it's, it's very much uncertain right now. Uh, it's certainly what we'll all be watching and uh, why we don't want people to uh, let up uh, sooner than once you know we've really got the situation under control. Uh, in places where UK variant has become dominant, you have seen uh, lockdown measures have to, have to be tightened even further. You know, when UK variant became the dominant strain in UK, uh, they were in lockdown and they saw a spike in cases. They have since controlled that spread. Uh, and in, in most pl places, uh, even where UK variant and other variants are dominant, you are seeing a decline in cases now, but uh, it was a lot more difficult. So hopefully what we have in place now uh, will be sufficient and we can keep it up long enough that uh, we get enough vaccine in people's, people's arms to end this wave. Thank you, Dr. Mackey. And Andrew, uh, we're going to come back to your other questions as well. Um, we're going to move down to a question from uh, Jane Sims. We haven't heard from Jane yet. Okay, Dr. Mackey, uh, and this is again more clarification um, around the death we're reporting. I, I think we've answered that, Jane. Um, Colin Butler, he has got a question here. Colin Butler, CBC London. Dr. Mackey, do you know why downhill skiing has been excluded from the list of approved winter activities under Ontario's pandemic health orders? Ontario is the only jurisdiction in North America to close ski areas during COVID-19. 
Yeah, for sure. Thanks for the question, Khaled. So uh, there are two risks with downhill skiing, one of which can be mitigated and the other is very difficult to mitigate. Uh, lift lines and gatherings on the hill are somewhat simpler to mitigate. You know, you can space the lift lines out. You can uh, design the facilities on site uh, to be a little bit, uh, you know, mm -hmm. less uh, conducive to large gatherings. The problem is off-piste activity. Uh, we know that, you know, part of the skiing culture is social gatherings and that uh, those are very difficult to entangle in reality, even though the intentions might be good. So th those are the reasons you've got lift lines and uh, the social aspect of skiing, which are difficult to control. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mackey. Let's go to um, Andrew Graham again. Dr. Mackey, are you able to provide an update regarding the outbreak at EMDC? Yeah, I don't have exact stats in front of me, Andrew. I can tell you that we have seen continued spread among uh, staff and inmates there, and uh, Dan can probably follow up with uh, specific stats later today by email if you're interested in those. Thank you very much. Let's go to the next questions. And I'm sorry, I'm bouncing around a little bit uh, just because of all the questions we have. And again, uh, questions around the death that was reported on Saturday. Again, Dr. Mackey has indicated that there's not really any more information that can be shared. So um, that is why we're just sort of moving around. OK, Merrick Sutherland at CTV. Uh, what is the status of the retirement home vaccination plan? How many homes or residents do you think will be able to be inoculated with the current vaccine supply? Yeah, so um, the we will have all of the um, back, the long term care high risk retirement homes vaccinated by Wednesday. Altogether, that's something in the range of uh, just over 6000 residents of long term care and retirement homes. That's on top of the uh, 10,000 or so staff uh, that were vaccinated at the Agriplex. So things are really moving in a positive direction in terms of getting those uh, high risk folks protected in our area. Thank you very much. Let's go to our next question. Uh, Dr. Mackey, what is the criteria to be considered a high risk retirement home? As mentioned, these will be the next to receive the vaccines. Yes, so the high risk retirement homes, and these are, uh, essentially defined by the ministry and uh, those would include retirement homes that are co-located with long-term cares because of the potential crossover of staff and others uh, they would include homes that have had challenges with uh, staffing levels keeping their staffing levels up uh, homes that have had recent or ongoing outbreaks those sorts of things uh, really focused on those risks. You, we've also, I mean, all of the homes have really upped their game in terms of infection prevention and control. Uh, so if that were an issue, that would be a factor in terms of defining risk, but uh, that's not really a dominant issue. You know, there are some homes that have difficult uh, situations from uh, the perspective of the physical layout of the home, and obviously that is considered as well. Uh, and, and in no doubt was part of the significant spread at Middlesex Terrace and Country Terrace. Thank you, Dr. Mackey. And Andrew Graham has a question too, while we're talking about uh, residents in long-term care and um, in the high-risk retirement homes. Regarding the vaccines, Andrew asks, will long-term care home residents who already had COVID-19 still be vaccinated in London and Middlesex County? Yeah, so people that have had, uh, who've already had COVID-19 are eligible for the vaccine they aren't very first front of the line, and that's because they have some residual protection. Cases of reinfection do occur, but in Canada, they have been quite rare. So uh, because the vaccine is in such source, short supply, trying to get it to those that have no immunity whatsoever at first, and of course, there will be additional vaccine in the future available for those that have had COVID before. Thank you, Dr. Mackey. Uh, next question, we're moving along. To Dr. Ducolo, this is from Jennifer Beeman at the London Free Press. Dr. Ducolo, has LHSC been able to maintain normal volumes at its UH emergency room despite the ongoing outbreak in that unit? Thanks, Jen. Uh, so LHSC, uh, at our UH Emerge is open and ready to receive patients and is a safe place to, to do so and is, all, is able to uh, operate at the same volumes that we were operating at prior to the outbreak. 
Um, however, uh, with uh, with situations like this, the public does. Uh, th there is some people in the public who would not prefer not to go to a, a UH because of the outbreaks. So the volumes have decreased there. Um, that's part of the reason that I want to reassure our community that we it is open and safe to, to receive care. Uh, the volumes have trended down over the past number of weeks, uh, but we are still able to see this similar sort of 170, 180 patients a day we would have seen prior to the pandemic. Very much, Dr. Ducolo. Um, okay, just moving down. Jane Sims had a question for you, Dr. Mackey, and this goes back to how COVID deaths are reported and how uh, that is um, reported by the health unit. Jane is asking, does that mean that some of the 170 fatalities in the Middlesex London region may not have died from COVID-19 complications? Uh, not quite. So the case, it, we would we would only exclude the case. So we would include the case where where COVID would have been a contributing factor uh, or or a primary cause of death. The only time when we wouldn't count the case uh, as a COVID death is if we were able to determine, and really it's the coroner, if the coroner were able to determine definitively that the cause of death was not related. So, you know, you can imagine that people with COVID might theoretically be, uh, you know, walking in traffic and hit by a car or something like that. They should be isolated at home, but, uh, you know, you can die of other things, uh, even, you know, when you're diagnosed with COVID. So, so those would be the situation uh, where people um, would be taken out of the case count. So, in general, we're able to make that determination whether COVID had some role in the deaths. And so there wouldn't be very many at all. Uh, this may be, you know, the only one, uh, but there wouldn't be very many at all in our death counts that uh, COVID wasn't a contributing factor in any way. Thank you, Dr. Mackey. And there are a couple of questions that uh, I don't think we have addressed yet. And I'm going to combine them. One is from Jennifer Beeman. She is asking whether the teen whose death was reported Saturday was ever hospitalized for COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And included with that is a question from Kate Dubinsky at the London Free Press asking whether the teen died in hospital or elsewhere. Yeah, the, the individual did present to the emergency room. Um, and I believe that was a visit where he ended up uh, passing. I'm not sure, Dr. Duclo, if you have further information. I don't have further information on that particular case. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mackey. Let's move down and again, moving down through the questions. Um, so here's a follow up question from Kate Dubinsky, Dr. Mackey. Are you frustrated that you can't tell the community more about the team's death? And are you concerned that the messaging from the health unit appears to be playing into the narrative that the health unit is trying to manipulate COVID death rate numbers? You know, I'm not concerned about that. Um, that's clearly not the case. I think that uh, anyone who looks closely at the facts can see that that's not the case. Uh, you know, we always have to have to balance the rights of the individual to privacy with the, the rights and the need to inform the public. So that's a balance we're working with every day, and uh, I'm quite comfortable with how we manage that balance. Thank you, Dr. Mackey. Um, all right. So another question from Kate Dubinsky. Uh, Dr. Mackey, I don't know how much information you can provide here. Was the teen who died ever on a ventilator or ever in ICU because of COVID-19 symptoms? Uh, we, I don't have that, unfortunately, at this point. All right. Thank you. And I'm just going to go back through the questions quickly just to see if we've missed anything. Um, all right. Um, we, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm fumbling a bit here. There were a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of questions here, and I'm just making sure that we got them. I think we I think we have I think we have so um, that does bring us to the end of the questions and again um, a lot of those questions I did uh, respond to the reporters who've asked them because there were a lot of repetition and also again uh, information that we were not 
able to um, provide more information um, for the reasons that Dr. Mackey outlined earlier on in today's briefing. So that does bring us to the end of today's questions. We appreciate you tuning in. We appreciate your time, Dr. Mackey, Dr. Duclo, Mayor Holder, thank you for your information and uh, for your time this afternoon as well. Uh, one announcement we do need to make is that this week's second virtual media briefing will not be happening on Thursday this week. Instead, it will be happening on Wednesday at 2 p.m. So make sure that you join us then Wednesday afternoon. I almost caught myself there. Wednesday afternoon, 2 p.m. right here. So between now and then, have a great rest of your Monday and we'll see you on Wednesday. So long for now.